So just a short video today. The other day I got this Toshiba T1000 laptop up and running and I mentioned that I was using a zip drive as a replacement hard disk for this class of ancient machine with no internal storage and I thought it might be amusing to actually demonstrate doing this and show you how it works. So for background, this is a Toshiba T1000. It's a 1980-something, very early laptop. It's one of the first true portable DOS laptops. That is, it runs off battery power. All the others tended to run off mains. It's got 512 kilobytes of RAM, a floppy disk drive, DOS in ROM, which is what it's running from now, and no hard drive. What you're intended to do with it is to buy the RAM expansion, which fits in here, and partition the RAM into working RAM and some storage. But I don't have that, so I'm stuck with using the floppy disk drive, which is kind of painful. But I have a zip drive. In fact, I have several zip drives. This is a zip drive. This was Iomega's attempt to, quote, disrupt, unquote, the floppy disk market with a cheap and cheerful removable storage device, which takes these disks. Each disk stores 96 megabytes. It's decently fast. It was decently cheap. And they made lots of these, and they were pretty popular for a while. But unfortunately, two things killed them off, one of which was cheap flash storage, and the other was that Iomega's attempt to make them cheap and cheerful actually made them cheap and nasty. Zip drives are notoriously flaky. I actually own five, two of which have died. I also have this USB zip drive which I plug into my real computer and use to put things on disks. And this one also started to make really nasty crunching noises, and I think it's dying too. And you'll find zip drives cheaply in any place that sells computer junk. Finding one that works is slightly harder. Anyway, let us fire this thing up and see how it works. So the first thing we need is some power. And I shall attempt to get the wire ah, into its little duct. One of the zip drives I actually managed to explode by connecting the wrong power supply to it. So now I am more careful. There we go. And the green light is on, indicating it works. Zip drives are SCSI internally. Uh, you can plug them in either via a SCSI connection, a parallel connection, which is what this is, or for the later ones, USB. But this is a parallel one. So this goes in here. And this plugs in here. And they will work on even unidirectional parallel ports, which is what makes them so great for these old XT machines, because they all had parallel ports and they'll all work with a zip drive. So, now we have it. What we need next is the driver. Iomega did make drivers for DOS and you got one with each drive, but the driver was both pretty big, like 100 kilobytes, which is like intolerable on a machine this spec, and also didn't run on anything lower than a 286. Luckily, a replacement driver is available. It's called PalmZip. It is commercial software by, trying to pronounce his name correctly, Klaus Pichel. And it costs the princely slum of eight euros, and it is strongly worth having if you're into these machines. I have a copy on floppy disk here, but because this machine runs off ROM, I can't actually install the driver. There is nowhere to put it. So what we need is another disk, which is blank, and we're going to install DOS onto it. 
put the driver on the floppy disk and then boot the machine from the floppy disk. Now I have previously formatted it. Let me just adjust the contrast to make sure this shows up on the camera. There we go. One empty disk. Uh, drive C here is the ROM. So what we do now is we run the sys command to make the disk bootable. Which takes a few moments. And that has copied the DOS kernel onto the disk. Unfortunately, there's a bug in this version of sys, which is it doesn't actually copy the command shell. So let's do that manually. OK, that is done. So we now have a bootable disk that will boot ROM. Now we want to get the driver onto it. Now there is a slight problem here in that this machine only has one floppy disk drive and we have two disks. Uh, that is the driver there, palmzip.sys, and it is all of two and a half kilobytes. Luckily, DOS will quite happily pretend that it's got more than one disk. You simply say copy from drive A to drive B. It's been configured to know there is no physical drive B, so what it will do is it will simply prompt me to swap disks. So this should do it. Done. Now we don't need this anymore. So uh, back to drive A. I've changed disks. So there it is. Now we need to set up the config sys. And we're going to use the venerable Edlin for this because this oops, is the only editor this machine has. So Edlin A config sys. Edlin is a very, very early line editor. There's no text display. You do everything on the command line. You see the star prompt there. So we can use P to list the current file, which is, of course, empty. I to insert text. So device equals zip.sys. Uh, check mode, which checks to see if the zip drive is installed before doing anything with the driver. F to tell it it's a fixed disk. Buffers equals 30. Files equals 30. Always worth having. And Control Z to finish. So now I can print the file, which does nothing because we're, the cursor is on line 4. Change to line 1. Print. There it is. E to save and exit. And we also need a to exec bat. I'm going to insert set path equals C. The reason for that is all the utility files are on drive C, so we need to add it to the path so when we type a command it will find it. And we also tell it that command.com is on drive C so that if DOS needs to reload the command shell, it loads the ROM version rather than the floppy disk version. But we still have to have a command shell on the floppy disk because the environment variable here is set by the command shell, so it has to load it before it can set it. It's stupid. Later versions of DOS allowed you to set variables in the configs. Okay, we should be done. So reboot. Short pause, boot from floppy, palm zip loads, Klaus Peichel, I did mispronounce his name, and we're ready to go. Drive C is the ROM, drive D is the zip drive, oops, we've got to, we've got to actually insert the disk. And there we go, it just works. Performance is not brilliant, 
but it's an XT class machine, so it's never going to be brilliant. It's much faster than the floppy disk drive. Uh, the uh, the disk here is actually 96 megabytes, but DOS 2 on this machine can only cope with drives of up to 32 megabytes. In fact, it's partitioned into three. So we actually get drive D, drive E, and drive F. On drive D, I put some utilities, QBasic, the all-important Gorilla.bass, and I attempted to install Windows, but I can't make it work. The Toshiba's a bit weird. Drive E is, of course, for games. And I have Turbo Racer. Let's try this, fire this up. And as you can see, it's all a bit muddy. So it's a very crude racing game. It runs admirably quickly on this slow machine. You have to try and dodge oncoming traffic. And it is ludicrously hard. Yeah, got no reaction time. Anyway, let's deal with that. We've got the famous Alley Cat. Which takes a few moments to load. It's even got music. Unfortunately, this one turns into complete hash on this LCD. Yeah, I can barely see what I'm doing. I believe you're supposed to jump onto these barrels. But how much you jump seems to depend enormously on how fast you're going. So it's really difficult to judge. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, you can't actually exit this as far as I know, so let's just reboot. This is not really a gaming machine, it's a business machine. The text display is pretty decent. You can get a choice of two fonts. Thick and thin. I've got Arctic Adventure, which runs reasonably well, but it takes a while to load and it's pretty hard, so I'm not going to try it here. We've got the Monkey Island Demo, which surprisingly runs just fine, though this black on white screen makes all the graphics look really weird. The CGA emulation turns everything into hash, and it takes like 10 minutes to get through the unskippable intro sequence, so not demonstrating that one. Tomb of the Pyramids works reasonably well. Uh, the best one of the lot is probably this, which is, of course, Dangerous Dave. This is a bigger game. It's all of, like, 90k, so it takes a little while to load. And, yeah, this works. Again... The graphics is hash. But it's quite playable. It runs at full speed. The weirdest thing about this game, it's not just not the sound, it's Dave's jumping physics, which are extremely strange. Yeah, this works fine. I just need to wait for Dave to reach the end. There we go. We can quit. The long thin aspect ratio, which is 80 characters across for 25 down and the characters are all square, does make a lot of the games quite difficult to play, I have to say. It's much better at graphical stuff. Uh, sorry, at text-based stuff than graphics. But... Uh, I don't use this for real work, so I don't have any programming tools installed on it, other than Quick Basic, which is currently loading very, very slowly. I believe this is the QBasic from DOS 5, and it's kind of big for this low-grade machine. So uh, let's load a file. Of course, we're going to be loading Gorilla. So you see, just loading the file takes a while. 
this is it parsing it at about 30 lines of code a second. Which it's not that big a file either. There we go. So this is the program itself. And yeah, notice, let's keep scrolling even though I've let go of the down key. The text editor cannot quite keep up with what I'm doing. This program is just too big for this little machine. But it does run pretty well. The actual runtime performance is pretty decent. Yeah, let's watch the intro. First we have to wait for the gorillas to be drawn. Yes, well, you've probably seen Gorillas. This is the basic game that was shipped with QBasic in DOS to demonstrate QBasic once they decided that Donkey.Bass was possibly a little bit, you know, not that impressive. So let's try velocity 40, is that gonna work? You can just see the banana flying here. The SLCD is not great for animation. And the performance isn't up to much. Am I going to hit it? I might. No, it's a miss. Yeah, anyway, enough of this. So let's quit. Now, you probably can't hear it on the camera, but the spinning zip drive makes a whining grating noise that's pretty similar to the old school Winchester hard drives before they invented fluid bearings and it niggles away at the corner of your perception all the while you're using it and it's it's not even it 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 sort of oscillates up and down a little and it really 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 irritating so yeah that's not great uh, turning the thing off or ejecting the disc is so much nicer, which is actually a nice, satisfi satisfying solenoid-based thing. Palm zip candles replacing the disc just fine. It just sort of works. So, yeah, there you have it. A zip drive on an old XT-class machine. I've used this drive on several of my old machines. So given that this is starting to break down and I've got four of these and two of them are dead so I've got this one and a spare and that's it and the notorious unreliability I have discovered somebody who's built a very simple circuit that allows you to bit bang a SD card using the parallel port so I might investigate that in the future it, it's a shame to lose the the mechanical aspect, which is very satisfying to use, apart from the grating noise. And palmzip.sys is amazingly small and fast. The SD card driver is more complex. But, yeah, the reliability is not great in these. Anyway, if you have any XT-class machines with no storage, and you want a quick and dirty way to get more storage on them for demos. You could do worse than try and find a, one of the rare working zip drives and give this a go. Get a copy of Palm Zip. Very easy, very simple. It will work up until it breaks down. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video such as it is. Please let me know what you think in the comments.